Welcome to Lesson 2E, Motion of Fluid Particles. We're going to introduce the four fundamental types of fluid motion. We'll define them in terms of rates. In this lesson, we'll do the first three. We'll save rotation for next lesson. We'll also define volumetric strain rate, and we'll combine linear and shear strain rates into one tensor, which we'll call the strain rate tensor. There are four types of fluid motion. We're talking about a fluid particle. The first one is translation. I'm going to use a simple square to indicate the fluid particle. Translation means it simply moves from one place to another, and I'll use red to indicate the new location and or shape. Translation is simply movement. We also have dilatation, also called linear strain, where our original square particle becomes rectangular. In the case I've drawn, it's stretched horizontally and it's shrunk vertically. These are, of course, for two-dimensional flows, but you can imagine similar things happening in three dimensions. Then there's shear strain, where the particle actually distorts with angles changing. So we would say that this one is distortion of angularity, whereas dilatation is stretching or shrinking. And notice the angles are all 90 degrees for both the original and the stretched particle. But here the angles have changed. The fourth one is rotation, where the particle has rotated. In fluid mechanics, we prefer rates. We use rates since fluids distort continuously. In solid mechanics, we could describe the same motions, but not as rates, just as motions themselves. Consider first the rate of translation. Suppose we have some small particle at point P. It moves at some velocity ui, and sometime later it's at point P prime. This would be at time t, and this would be at a short time later t plus dt. Translation would be defined as xi at t plus dt minus xi at t, where xi is the position vector. So the rate of translation is the translation divided by dt as dt gets small. In other words, we take the limit as dt goes to zero of this quantity. Well, this is the fundamental definition of a derivative, or dxi dt. Therefore, the rate of translation is dxi dt, which is simply the velocity vector. That one's kind of obvious. The rate of translation is the velocity vector. Now consider the rate of dilatation, or linear strain rate. The word dilate means to become larger. For example, the pupils in your eyes dilate, meaning they get bigger. Dilatation means the fractional increase in length, or linear strain. To illustrate, we'll consider a tiny line segment, AB, in a fluid flow in the x1 direction only. At time t, we have a line segment. We'll define A as the left point and B as the right point. The length of this line segment is delta x1. Suppose the velocity at point A is u1, only in the x1 direction, to the right. Using a truncated Taylor series expansion, the speed at B would be a little bit bigger in this case, u1 plus del u1 del x1 times delta x1. We're ignoring higher order terms like del squared u1 del x1 squared, since we're going to let this segment shrink to zero size. This is at time t. At time t plus dt, a short time later, we'll use primed quantities. So here's our initial line segment with points A and B, but it has moved and stretched to this point A prime and this point B prime. Let's put on some dimensions. The original length is delta x1. The distance from A to A prime is u1 dt. This distance, therefore, would be delta x1 minus u1 dt. This distance would be the speed of B times dt, which would be u1 plus del u1 del x1, delta x1. That's this speed, the whole thing times dt. This is the old length at time t, and this is the new length from a prime to b prime at t plus delta t. Now let's define linear strain as the new length minus the old length divided by the old length. This is a non-dimensional quantity since length appears on the numerator and denominator. This is also the fractional increase in length that we call the dilatation up here. And this is only in the x1 direction. So the linear strain in the x1 direction equals the new length from our diagram. It's this length plus this length, delta x1 minus u1 dt plus u1 plus del u1 del x1, delta x1 quantity dt. That's the new length minus the old length, 
which is simply delta x1, divided by the old length, delta x1. Well, this cancels this, and negative u1 dt cancels a positive u1 dt. Then the delta x1s cancel, and all we're left with is del u1 del x1 dt. Note that we let delta x1 shrink to zero. So we're really talking about the linear strain at a point. Now, as I said, we like to deal in rates, not motions themselves. So we define the linear strain rate in the x1 direction as this quantity divided by dt as dt goes to zero. In other words, just del u1 del x1, or in common notation, u1 comma 1. Similarly, the linear strain rate in the x2 direction turns out to be del u2 del x2, or u2 comma 2. And similarly, in the x3 direction. So these are our linear strain rates. We also define a volumetric strain rate, which is a kind of three-dimensional version of these linear strain rates. We also call this a bulk strain rate. We define this as the rate of volume increase of a fluid particle per unit volume. You can see that this is kind of a three-dimensional version of what we had up here, which was the increase in length over the old length. This is the increase in volume over the original volume. Mathematically, this would be 1 over a small volume delta V times the material derivative of delta V, where we use material derivative since we're following this volume as it expands or contracts. It turns out that volumetric strain rate is U1 comma 1 plus U2 comma 2 plus U3 comma 3 or UI comma I in tensor notation, where the I's are summed, as you can see here. If you're still not comfortable with common notation, this simply means del u1 del x1 plus del u2 del x2 plus del u3 del x3, or del ui del xi. So these are the two common ways to write the volumetric strain rate. Now let's look at general two-dimensional fluid motion. I'll quickly read this. A fluid particle can undergo four different types of motion, which we express as rates, as we talked about. Rate of translation and rate of dilatation we've already talked about. We also have rate of shear strain and rate of rotation. In the diagram below, we show all four of these simultaneously. Again, this is for 2D flow in the x1, x2 plane. But we can easily extend to three dimensions. We let point P be the fluid particle with neighbor particles A and B, as shown here. Here's point P, A is to the right, and B is up at distances delta x1 and delta x2. This is at time t. At time t plus dt, point P has moved to P prime, point A has moved to A prime, and point B has moved to B prime. Again, we use Taylor series expansions, and we truncate to first order. If the speed to the right at point P is u1, the speed at A is u1 plus u1 comma 1 delta x1. Similarly, in the vertical direction, the particle has moved u1 dt to the right and u2 dt up to get to point P prime. Since this is the speed of B up, the distance would be that speed times dt to get up to B prime. And similarly, with point A, both to the right giving this value and up giving this value based on this velocity. If you don't get this right away, study this diagram carefully. For example, this is the speed of point A upward. So point A moves upward by a distance of that speed that we have here times dt. We'll use this diagram to define the next rate of motion, which is shear strain rate. At time t, we have our initial fluid element, again in the two dimensions, x1 and x2. And this is a right angle. As it translates and distorts, this is the original shape translated, but the actual shape is also distorted to some shape like that. Let's call this angle d alpha and this angle d beta. This is a time t plus dt. We define shear strain rate here in the 1, 2 plane as the rate of decrease of the angle between two originally perpendicular lines. Here are the x1 and the x2 directions, and we're considering these two line segments, which are initially perpendicular. But as it moved and distorted, that angle is no longer 90 degrees. Since this is defined as a rate of decrease rather than increase, you can see that the angle has decreased by d alpha and by d beta. So the rate of this change is d alpha dt plus d beta dt. After some trig in algebra, which I'm not going to show, by the way, a squiggly arrow always means that I'm doing some algebra. And using this diagram to help us with these angles, here's where the trig comes in with these lengths and angles. 
you can show that the shear strain rate sub 1, 2, meaning in the x1 and x2 directions, or x1 and x2 plane, is del u1 del x2 plus del u2 del x1. Again, letting this fluid particle shrink to a point. So this is really the shear strain rate at a point. If you do the same thing in the 2, 3 plane, the x2 and the x3 plane, we get del u2 del x3 plus del u3 del x2. And similarly for the x1, x3 plane. So we have three strain rates in the three primary planes. You can also define strain rate 2, 1, where we just switch 2s to 1s and 1s to 2, 3, 2, and 3, 1, etc. So there's actually six of these. But you can see that strain rate 1, 2 would be the same as strain rate 2, 1. In other words, it's symmetric. Finally, let's talk about the strain rate tensor. I'll use capital SIJ. I just note here that some authors use a little EIJ or a capital EIJ. What is the strain rate tensor? We combine the normal, in other words, the linear, and tangential, in other words, the shear strains, into one second order tensor. Here are the components. S11 is del ux1, or u1, comma 1. S22 is del u2 del x2, or u2, comma 2. S33 is del U3 del X3, or U33. These are the linear strain rates. The shear strain rates are defined as S12 equal 1 half del U1 del X2 plus del U2 del X1, or in common notation, which is preferred here because it's easier to write, we have 1 half U1 comma 2 plus U2 comma 1. Similarly, for S13 and the rest of them, where I'm just staying in common notation here. These are the shear strain rates. Uh, uh, but sir, there seems to be a factor of a half compared to what you told us before. Good catch, Boris. That factor of a half wasn't there in these shear strain rates we previously defined. This factor of a half is necessary to combine these two into one tensor. We write this one tensor then as capital SIJ, writing it in matrix format, S11, S12, S13, S21, S22, S23, S31, S32, S33. We see that the diagonal components are the normal or linear strain rates, and the off-diagonal components equal half the shear strain rates. Finally, in tensor notation, we write this second-order tensor as one-half del ui del xj plus del uj del xi or in common notation, one-half ui, comma, j, plus u, j, comma, i. This is the strain rate tensor in tensor notation. And finally, as I've already said, this tensor is symmetric, meaning that this value must be the same as this value, this one the same as this one, and this one the same as this one. In the next lesson, we'll look at rate of rotation. Thank you for watching this video. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel for more videos.